British Columbia is a really unique place in Canada to look for fossils because we have well over 500 million years of the fossil record preserved in this province. At the Natural History Gallery at the Royal British Columbia Museum, we have an amazing collection of fossils from Vancouver Island from the end of the age of dinosaurs, the Cretaceous period. But Vancouver Island was actually underwater at that time period. So we have amazing fossils of animals that lived in the ocean alongside the dinosaurs, things like ammonites, crabs, seashells that would look very similar to the things that you might find on a beach today, and a lot of animals that would look very unfamiliar to anyone beachcombing on Vancouver Island nowadays. We even have a single fossil of a dinosaur found right here on Vancouver Island. This little bone is from the tail of an ostrich mimic dinosaur, an ornithomimid. So Vancouver Island was mostly underwater, but dinosaur bones would occasionally wash into these shallow marine sediments. So we know that dinosaurs lived nearby here at that time. We also know that dinosaurs lived elsewhere in British Columbia, like up in the north. And so my job is to actually go and find more dinosaur fossils so that we can have even more amazing animals from the end of the age of dinosaurs on display here. And what we're looking at here are the bones of one of the very first dinosaurs ever collected in British Columbia. They were found by a geologist uh, working along what was then the in-construction BC rail line, the Deese Lake extension uh, going through northern British Columbia. And the geologist's name was Kenny Larson. He was prospecting actually for uranium and other economically valuable minerals and doing surveys along this sort of a uh, uh, railway line that was creating lots of new fresh rock exposures. And he stumbled across these bones sitting on the, on the sort of scree slopes, the little rubble piles, pretty much as is. So he was able to pick up these pieces um, he recognized them as vertebrate bones, as, as bones. Uh, now, he thought they might belong to a big sloth, which makes a lot of sense when you take a look at this claw here, uh, but they actually turned out to be part of a dinosaur. We've got an articulated toe from one of the hind feet, so we've got one, two, three bones of that particular toe, including the claw. We've got parts of another toe, these all go together. So one, two, three bones on the claw, all kind of articulate together. And we've got pieces of the front arm, like this radius. So that's a really nice, complete bone. So this is a really fun project to work on because it was found so long ago, it was actually one of the first dinosaurs ever found in British Columbia, but we didn't have a really good sense of exactly where it came from. So back in 2017, I actually led an expedition to go look for more of this particular dinosaur and to try to figure out what other plants and animals might have lived alongside it, how old geologically it was, and what kind of environment it lived in. So after the end of the age of dinosaurs, the Mesozoic era, we move into the Cenozoic era, the age of mammals. And so that's broken down into a couple of smaller time periods. The first after the end of the age of dinosaurs is the Paleocene. We don't know a whole lot about that time period because things were sort of recovering after this mass extinction. But the next period of time, the Eocene, is very well known in many places around the world for being one of the hottest periods of time of Earth's history. And so this is very interesting for paleontologists to study and for people interested in understanding climate change through time and what might be happening to humans in the future. British Columbia has multiple sites recording time from the Eocene. The Maccabee fossil beds are about 52 million years old, and they represent an ancient lake environment ringed by a forest that deposited leaves and insects into those lakes. And there are actually multiple lakes like that represented in British Columbia. It's sort of a string of sites that we call the Okanagan Highlands. The Maccabee fossil beds were deposited about 10 million years after the end of the age of dinosaurs. So the plants and insects that were around then lived after the dinosaurs had gone extinct. 
just before I took up my position at the Royal British Columbia Museum, the museum had received a very large donation of specimens from the Maccabee fossil beds, uh, representing as many as 18,000 fossils. So one of the first jobs after I arrived at the museum was to help unpack and catalog and sort these fossils. My late husband, John Leahy, was very involved with the Maccabee Fossil Site as he was a tour director and pretty well the educational manager for the site. After my husband passed away in 2015, I had many fossils. I actually had over 17,000 fossils in my house at the time. Linda Langevin and I decided that we would donate these fossils together because a lot of the fossils that were in my home were actually David Langevin's fossils as well. As he passed away in 2011, the Thompson Rivers University did not have the room to curate this large amount of fossils. So we felt that it was best to keep the collection together and donate them to to the Royal British Columbia Museum. Museums are important for a variety of reasons. Obviously, they're important in their role in explaining and interpreting our heritage to the public, and that's, that's part of the, the importance of museums. Another important factor that people don't necessarily think about is what goes on in the back rooms, and that is that they are the repository of sort of the memory of our province, the Royal British Columbia Museum holds all of these objects, and maybe the right pair of eyes won't look at it and understand what this means for five years or 50 years or 100 years. But sooner or later, someone's gonna open that door and say, I know what this is, and I know what this can tell us, because the museum has provided a stable, continuous place for these objects to be curated and held. And so museums are the storehouse of our memory, as well as the teaching uh, places for the public to understand what that memory is. Bruce Archibald is a fossil insect expert, and although it's a little bit away from dinosaurs, insects are really important parts of their ecosystems, and it's really important to understand how insects have evolved and changed through time. And insect fossils are actually kind of rare because insects don't have bones, so there aren't the hard parts that are easy to fossilize that we might find in dinosaurs or other backboned animals, or even invertebrates with shells, things like ammonites or, or crabs or clams. So, Victoria, this is my fossil that I found at Maccabee. It's a dragonfly wing. Excellent. It's a hind wing, and uh, I'm donating it to your collection here Perfect. at the RBC, uh, Royal BC Museum. Excellent. And this is the wing over here. You can oh, yeah. You can see, it's got the little dark That's spot great. called the terrace. Do you mind stadium. if I yeah, yeah, use go, my little magnifying glass? Go, go right look? ahead. Go right ahead. Oh, it's beautiful. The Maccabee Fossil Site is on a hillside right above the Trans-Canada Highway, uh, just about eight kilometers east of Cache Creek and Ashcroft in British Columbia on the way to Kamloops. Imagine the mud at the bottom of a deep lake, a lake that's probably cold and without oxygen at the bottom, so things that sink to the bottom don't decay. And that mud, year after year, lays down little bits of sediment on the bottom of the lake and leaves and insects and fish and all sorts of things that lived in the, in the lake and in the forest around the lake wind up coming to the surface of the lake, coming down through the water column and sitting on the mud at the bottom. And over the, the millennia, the mud gets squished down together. And then over the longer term, the millions of years, that mud gets turned into rock, into this kind of shale. And it preserves a record of who lived in this lake and who lived in the forest surrounding it. So here, it looks like we've got a uh, four-needle pine. Let's take a look at this. It's beautiful. I think the Maccabee Fossil Site is important to science, and, and beyond that, to the public in general, because through it, we can understand more deep questions about how the world became the way that it is today. There's a lot of questions that we can ask only by going to the past, because modern world systems may be difficult or too complicated to effectively answer some of those questions. So when we include the ancient world with the modern world, we can approach things from a little bit different angle. And the Maccabee is just such a wonderful place to do that.
So Christopher, what we have here, of course, is some classic examples of the beautiful fossils we have at the Maccabee fossil beds here in British Columbia, which show the wonderful diversity of different kinds of plants typical of the Maccabee beds. Yeah, Maccabee is really great because it has a great diversity of conifers, as well as broadleaf trees, like this Almus parvivolia, also known as alder today, uh, an excellent example of a leaf found at Maccabee, as well as the Comptonia columbiana here, otherwise known as sweet fern. You can see that there. Yeah, the sweet fern is an interesting one, of course, because this is a, a shrub, a woody shrub, that you find in the eastern part of North America today, but also in, in China today. So it shows these interesting connections between North America and, and China. Yes. We also have Metasequoia occidentalis, which has a modern relative still alive today, also in Asia. Um, these types of trees are deciduous conifers, and they really enjoy uh, living in swampy conditions. And that tells us a lot about what Maccabee used to be like. In the early 1990s, we had uh, mineral claims over the site. At that time, it was allowed for folks to stake a claim over a site to extract fossils because they were considered minerals then. So it's no longer possible since 2005. And what we did was work with the mineral claim holders. We compensated them for their claims and we uh, protected the site under heritage designation. Since 2012, the site has been protected and we are working with the community and the local first people to figure out how it will be managed. We are just like the fossil sites here. We're very, very unique. Uh, we're one of a kind, and we definitely want to hear our stories attached to this site because it's a part of our traditional lands, and we definitely want to be uh, sharing the history that is here. The connection to the university is long-standing. We've had a, a fossil collection going back at least 30 years through a former paleontologist that worked here. And since 2012, we have a memorandum of understanding with the British Columbia Heritage Branch. We hope that Thompson Rivers University will play an active uh, research and educational role in uh, the site as it develops and as buildings emerge on that site. When I'm at the site now, I, I feel a lot of sadness because when I first came to this site in the late 80s, early 90s, it was pretty much untouched. Uh, the site has been degraded tremendously. The fossil dealers that had the mineral claim brought in a bulldozer, uh, ostensibly for road work, but in reality to uh, do mechanical mining. And they destroyed a lot of the, the finest material with this bulldozer work. And a lot of the material apparently wound up in the international uh, underground, shall we say, fossil trade. And the fossil dealers that, that ran the site brought busloads of people up there, put hammers in their hands. There's a history of maltreatment of this site. And what is left needs to be treated very carefully and very responsibly. This site needs to stop being degraded. It needs to stop having these world-class heritage items treated like children's trinkets and tourist souvenirs. People. No, the time for people to come in and take fossils away should be gone. It's kind of like going in to uh, the Vatican and saying, you can bash off fingers and, and noses from these marble statues because it'd be great. Kids love it. Kids will take it away. And that's how it's been treated. This is world-class stuff. At Maccabee, now that it's a heritage uh, site, we have to manage the, the resource and preserve it. So. The site, I'm happy to say, will be open to the public very soon. And people can come and uh, find out more about the fossils and uh, look at displays and walk around, but they will not be able to pick a fossil and take it home. We uh, will look at ways in the future how we can allow members of the public to take home a uh, souvenir, let's say, but we're not there yet. We are not allowing anybody to collect at this point but we are very um, excited to have people come to the site and learn more about this, uh, this place and the fossils and the many heritage values.